in Matthew chapter uh, chapter nine this morning. Matthew chapter nine. What do you do when you don't know how to do something? Maybe uh, you've tried to fix something. You've had an item that's broken. Problem with an appliance. You're trying to put something together. Uh, maybe it's that new shelf you bought at the store. Uh, maybe it's Christmas time and you got a new set of Legos for your children and, and you have to put something together. What do you do when you get stuck? Okay, Google. Honest answer. <laughs> I've done that before. You might look up Google or YouTube. You might call a professional if it's a significant thing like your refrigerator is not working. You might try to figure it out yourself if you have that sort of mind that you can uh, fix problems. But I think the best way to go about doing something, if you have one available, is to look at the manual. Get out the instruction manual, get out the owner's manual of whatever it is you're trying to do. There are different types of manuals. Some manuals are very generic. They just have the basic bare bones. Some manuals are really technical. And I think you, you have uh, a spectrum. Some just give you the step-by-step -step instructions. One, two, three, four, put this piece here. Others are technical manuals, manuals that show you the blueprints or the layouts or how every component works. Uh, but I think, I think you understand that if you're trying to uh, fix something or get something to work and you're having trouble, a, a good bet is to open the manual and see how it works. What happens if you don't have a manual? Well, you might not understand how to fix the problem. You might not get how things are supposed to go. You might get some pieces mixed up. In fact, we had that issue just this weekend in our house where we bought a, a shelf of sorts and instead of looking at the instructions, decided just to put it together by sight and got about halfway through and realized we had to take it all apart again. That's what happens if you don't use the manual. Manuals are important. They're there for a reason. They're there to show us how to do something. And when it comes to uh, the idea of making disciples in a church, we have a manual of sorts to help us know how to do that. We have the instruction manual, the life of someone in the Bible who did what we're talking about in our sermon series, who stepped out of their comfort zone and stepped into the life of someone else. The manual, of course, is the Word of God, but more specifically, the instruction manual I'm talking about this morning is the life of our Savior, Jesus Christ. In His life, we have a model for what it looks like to step out of our own comfort zone and step into the life of someone else to help them become a better follower of Christ. And in fact, we get the word disciple that we use when we talk about discipleship, we get that word from Jesus and his interaction with his followers. So it makes sense that if we're going to talk about discipleship, we're going to emphasize what we've been emphasizing over the past couple weeks, it would make sense that we spend some time looking at the life of Jesus Christ. Let me catch up with that. Life of Christ, and we don't use it in our attempts to do discipleship. We might want to trust on man-made models or man-made efforts to help us do so, which usually, usually lead us to trust ourselves instead of trusting in God. But Christ gave us a simple method to follow if we are to step out of our lives and step into the life of someone else. And we find that in the pages of Scripture in the New Testament. And so today we're going to spend some time looking at this manual of sorts in the life of Jesus. And we're going to look at a Scripture passage, passage that gives us three simple steps for how we can follow the model or the manual of Christ when it comes to 
producing or reproducing other followers of Jesus. The big idea I want you to remember this morning is very simply this. Discipleship... We're in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 this morning. We'll read the whole text, verses 35 through 38. We'll spend two weeks on this. Teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of disease and all kinds of sicknesses. But when he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and cast down like sheep not having a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest surely is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beg the Lord of the harvest so that he might send out workers into his harvest. Let's talk about the, the context of what was going on in this passage here. Jesus was doing what he often did, going from city to city, preaching, teaching, uh, healing those who were sick, answering questions. Verse 35, if you have your Bible open, verse 35 is kind of a summary of the ministry of Christ up to this point. You can see three aspects of that in the text, or actually three three participles in the text, uh, showing what Jesus' ministry looked like. It says he was teaching... He was preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and he was healing. That was the ministry of Jesus up to this point. Right before he was about ready to commission his disciples and say, now I'm going to send you out. And as we think of the life of Jesus as a manual for discipleship, we see very clearly the intentionality of Jesus. Jesus was intentional. Stepping out of his life, and stepping into the life of those around him. We must be intentional as well. And as we look at verse 36 for our focus this morning, one simple verse, I think we learn three intentional practices that you and I can put into our lives to help us make other followers of Jesus. First one for us this morning, we have to open our eyes. And my clicker is going wonky here this morning. See if we can get us back. Open our eyes. You have to be willing to see. Of Jesus. You have to be willing to see people. Now, as we continue this morning, I should probably give you a, a definition of disciple and discipleship, because we've been using those words over the past couple weeks, and I I don't want to use them without giving a definition of a disciple. What is a disciple? Here's where I take my definition of disciple. It's from Matthew 4, verse 19. He said to them, follow me, and I will make you Make you into something. There's a transformation. The spirit, our spiritual life is all about transformation. That takes place in our heart. It comes out in our actions, but it starts in our heart. Christ changing us. In Matthew 4.19, he says, you are to become fishers of men. This involves our hands. It's what we do. So what is a disciple? A disciple of Jesus is very simply, very basic here this morning, someone who uses their head their heart, and their hands to follow Jesus, someone who recognizes the authority of Christ, someone who is transformed by the power of Christ, and someone whose actions start doing what Christ wants them to do. That's what I mean when I say the word disciple. And it includes what we talked about several weeks ago from Matthew 28, taking somebody along that process, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
No matter where they are in that journey, it's the process of what we call making a disciple. And so what does it mean when we talk about uh, discipleship? Let's see if I can get my slides to work here. Discipleship or making disciples is to build a relationship with And to do this in our spiritual lives, you have to see people. Let's go back to our text, Matthew 9, 36. It says very simply, Jesus saw the multitudes. Jesus saw the multitudes. He truly took time and he looked at them. He saw them for who they are. I like to use the phrase, I use this often. Walk slowly through the crowd. One of my professors in Bible college used to tell us that. Walk slowly through the crowd. We can be so busy in the hustle, the bustle of life, that it's easy for us just to kind of go through the repetitive motion of doing what we do every day. Go to work. Come home. Drink our coffee. Whatever it is for you. We forget to notice people. Even now in our kind of post-COVID world, we're a little bit far removed, but the post-COVID world, we kind of got out of the habit of having people over and getting together with people and having that sort of in-person fellowship. And it's easy to come to Jesus. The master disciple maker, the the, the man whose manual we're trying to follow this morning, Jesus noticed people. I'm so thankful for opportunities that God has given me to start building relationships with people in our town as I try to be visible in our community, as I try to walk slowly through my own crowd. I think I mentioned before, I tried to get up early on Sunday mornings and go to McDonald's and have a little steady morning with my coffee. And, and it, it, to be honest with you, it's hard. I have to get up early. I was out there at, I was a little late this morning, but I was out there at 6.15 and they were open and I'm thankful for that. But I've been starting to build a relationship with the weekend manager there and uh, she knows that I come and she remembered my order and this morning she gave me free coffee. She said it's on the house and I was able to tell her I'm a pastor and I I come here on Sunday mornings to try to pull my thoughts together and put the final touches on my my sermon. And she said, oh, that's great. This is a great place to do it. And, And now I have a connection with this lady, which is so incredible. And it's really not not that hard, right? You just have to be intentional. You have to walk slowly through the crowd. You have to see people. Now, boys and girls, if you're following along the kids' worksheets, you can draw a picture of Jesus looking at the crowds, which my picture is somewhere here. Maybe I'm not finding it. Oh, well. You can draw a picture of Jesus looking at the crowds. There we go. There's my little sketch art here. Find it in Matthew chapter 9, verses. 20 through 22, Mark 5, Luke 8. Uh, I love this story, the story of the woman who had the issue of blood. Remember that story? I preached on it uh, sometime in the past couple months. This woman had been bleeding for 12 uh, 12 years. She had this issue of blood. Mark tells us she had endured uh, so much. I think we could use the word trauma, medical trauma, at the hands of doctors and spent all of her life savings, and no one was able to figure out what was wrong with her, and she thought, if I could only touch the garments of Jesus, I'd be healed. And so she went to the crowd as the crowd gathered when Jesus came to her town, and she she reached in, and Jesus felt her touching him and said, who touched me? And as the story goes, the disciples, I can imagine, are probably looking at him confused. Jesus, you're in a crowd of people. Everyone is, is touching you, you know? And Jesus says, no, someone touched me. I felt power go out. And finally, this lady... Uh, admitted that she was one who touched Jesus, and she said she was healed, and he said, go in peace, your faith has made you well. But notice from that story and and some of these texts, there's a couple different versions of it.
environment. And if we are to follow the manual of the life of Christ in our lives, whether it be evangelism of the unsaved or whether it be mentoring of another believer, we're going to have to learn to slow down and stop and see people. I wonder, who would you see? Let's think about it for a moment. Who would you see? It could be your neighbor, unable to shovel their driveway in the wintertime. Could be a friend struggling with health issues. Could be the barista at the coffee shop who lives for the weekend because she has Saturday off. Could be the cashier at the grocery store working the second job to barely make ends meet. I wonder. If you were to walk slowly through the crowd, who would you see in your community if you really took time to see with the eyes of Jesus? What does your multitude look like right here in Salk Center, Minnesota? Well, I looked up some demographic info this week, and I want to share it with you. Actually, I want to give it to you in the form of a, a test, form of, ex of an exam. We're going to go back to school this morning. See how well you know your multitude. Here's some questions for you. What is the median age in Sauk Center? Again, these statistics are, are, are rough, but I'm doing the best I can here with what I can find. 30% of Sauk Center... Wonder what you would put down on this exam. Twenties. Well, how'd you do? Did you pass or fail? <laughs> Some of you don't, don't live in, in Sauk Center, but you go to church in Sauk Center, so it applies to you. Maybe you realize you need to put a little more effort into seeing. This is your community. This is our multitude here in town. And you know, the same applies, the same idea, the same concept applies to your church as well. We can make an effort to see those in our church building. We can see those who are struggling. You can notice when they're not at church and follow up with them with a text or card. You can see those who maybe they're on a friend, the friends. They kind of slip in and slip out. Maybe they feel like outsiders in our church. Maybe they feel disconnected. You can observe those who are interacting or those who are sitting off all by themselves. There's so much we can see. We just open our eyes. Too often we are so busy with life that we don't take time to open our eyes and therefore we have trouble stepping out of our comfort zone, stepping into the lives of those who need our ministry. We so easily get focused on our lives for us. Church can be kind of a, a one hour a, th a week thing. We come, we go, we leave and see you next week. But it ought to be so much more than that. We need to open our eyes to the needs and burdens of people around us, both in our church and in our community at large. From the motto of Christ, we learn that discipleship requires intentionality, so we need to be intentional about making disciples. 
Let's go back to our text, Matthew 9, 36. We find a second practice from the model of Christ that we can adopt if we are to be intentional in discipleship. We have to open our heart. Open our heart. To care. Notice what our text says about Jesus. When he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. Notice where Christ's heart went after he saw people, and, and he, he really saw them. He saw them as they were. He was moved with compassion. He opened his eyes, and he saw them in their true state, and it moved him. I did some study on this word for compassion that we find in our text this morning. It's an interested, interesting word. It's a word that carries the idea of being deeply moved or affected in your inner being. In fact, if you've ever read the King James Version and you've, you see the word bowels, bowels of mercies, that's the concept here. It's our innermost part of a person. Uh, this is, comes from kind of the Greek thought of the day. There was the idea that our bowels or our inward parts was our, our, our belly, was the, the seat of noble affections. Basically, when Christ sees the multitude, he is being moved at his innermost part when he sees the crowds. And this is an impact, a movement, a, a compassion that compels one to action. We'll see in a few moments that Christ does respond in action. Boys and girls, if you're following along, you can draw a picture of uh, how Jesus might have Did that. Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19, text says, He was on his way to Jerusalem, passing between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him, and he raised their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priest. And as they were going, they were cleansed. Understand, of course, that in Bible times, leprosy was basically a death sentence. There was no cure. Uh, it was a disease that affected your skin and eventually called, caused your phalanges to start basically rotting away and falling off. And lepers were not accepted in regular society in this day, and so they kind of had their own little colonies, and they were expected to shout out when people would come near them, stay away, unclean, I, I'm a leper, you don't want to get this disease. And many times lepers went completely unseen and overlooked. Uh, but notice that's not how Jesus responded in our story. The lepers met him, they kept their distance, but Jesus had mercy on them. Many travelers would have kept on going, would have never paid them another mind. And Jesus was moved. He had compassion. He didn't just see them. He kept, uh, he didn't just see them and kept on going. He responded and he healed them. I wonder when was the last time you responded to the condition of someone in your area? How about the multitude around us? Respond. Let me give you some other statistics that I looked at for our community this week. We live in a very unreached community. Does that move you? Do you hear those things and have the compassion of Jesus on the people in poverty, on the single parents, on those who are divorced? We need the compassion of Christ. What about when it comes to believers? Are you moved with compassion for other believers, the ones 
Uh, the ones who maybe have lost a loved one. Just this summer, we celebrated Father's Day. Not too long before that, Mother's Day. You take time to feel for those for whom those holidays aren't completely a celebration. Someone who's lost their parents. Someone who's lost the mother or father of their children. Those who are estranged from their family members. Do you take time to feel? What those people feel. I made it a habit in previous ministries to mark down the anniversary dates of, of funerals that I would go to or those who have lost loved ones, and I would try to send them a, a card every year uh, just telling them that I remember. Great practice. You can do that. What about the individual getting ready for surgery? The person dealing with a chronic health issue? The young person getting ready for their first year of high school or going back to college after summer break. A single mom working hard to provide for her family and keep it all together. The person who's scared to death because of their anxiety, they don't even want to go outside. The person who has faithfully served for years in church, but as they get older, they find they can't do as much. and They're struggling over guilt because they can't do as much as they used to. The person who comes to church for fellowship, but they have trouble making friends, and so it's kind of a double-edged sword. They want to go, but they don't want to be there. The parent who's watching their child make wrong choices, and they can't do anything to stop them. Could you see those people enough to allow your heart to be moved with the compassion of Jesus that would cause you to step into their lives? and affect them positively for the cause of Christ, encourage them? Could you see them enough to help them bear that burden, help them grow through that process and become better followers of Jesus through that experience? This is what it means to see the multitude. Our multitude, right here in our church, in our town, and have compassion. Can you intentionally see them? Intentionally allow yourself to be moved with the compassion of Jesus towards them. Let me say a word to those who might be here. Maybe it's your first time in church. Maybe you just hopped on the live stream this morning and thought you'd check it out. And maybe you had some misconceptions about who Jesus is. Let me just point out to you that the Jesus in this passage has this same care and compassion for you even if you're not a child of his. And if you came this morning or you're on our live stream and you just happen to find this one sermon and it's the only one that you watch, I want to express to you that Jesus loves you. And Jesus has this very same compassion on you, so much so that he came to save you. And if you will place your faith in him for eternal salvation, he will grant that. We need to see the heart of Jesus. See with the eyes of Jesus. Be moved the way Jesus was moved. We learn from our manual this morning that discipleship requires intentionality. You have to be intentional. So let's be intentional when it comes to making better followers of Christ. Let's go back to our text as we finish out this morning. We're talking about discipleship and we're looking at the life of Jesus as a manual for us to follow. And the manual doesn't do any good if it's just sitting around. We don't crack it open, if we don't follow it. And so that's what we're trying to do this morning, follow the manual of the life of Christ. And we saw that the first practice we can adopt, that Jesus adopted for helping others in their walk of faith, is to open our eyes. The second practice is to open our hearts. Very simple this morning. Open our eyes, open our hearts, and Third, open your mouth. Open your mouth. You have to be willing to do. You have to be willing to do something about what we see. Because it doesn't do any good to see. And it doesn't do any good to be moved with compassion if we're not going to try to solve that issue. And look at what our text says. When Jesus looked at the multitude, Matthew 9.36, he was moved with compassion because they were distressed 
and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Distressed is the idea of being weary, troubled. Dispirited literally means to be thrown down. You ever feel like that in your spiritual life? You can relate, I'm sure. I know I can. He looks at the multitude. They were weary like sheep without a shepherd. They had no direction. Sheep without a shepherd are are basically going to die. They can't find the pasture themselves. They can't find the water themselves. They don't have anyone to protect them from thieves or robbers. What a horrible condition to be in. And notice what Christ did. It's not expressed clearly in our text this morning. Maybe it's more of an implication. But he saw that the people didn't have a shepherd, and so what did he do? He came to be their shepherd. He came to resolve that problem and be their shepherd because his heart was moved with compassion because he saw the multitude. They kind of build off off of one another. He came to address man's greatest need, their need for salvation. Boys and girls, if you're following along in the children's worksheets, you can draw a And if we look at the life of Jesus as a manual, I think we'll see how he lived this out very practically. In fact, you could go back to the beginning of of Matthew chapter 9. And he gathered at a house, and it was so full, it was standing room only. People were filing out the door. You, you, You couldn't get close to Jesus. And some men brought their friend, their paralyzed friend, to come to Jesus, because they had heard about the miracle worker and how he healed people. Imagine the effort, the work of hauling their friend, however far they hauled him, and get there and see the packed house and say, oh, no, we're never going to get in there. And they devised a plan, and they opened up the roof, and they uh, lowered uh, the man down, because that's obviously what you would have done, right? Screws were a little bit different in Bible times. But they were desperate. And they lowered this guy down, and imagine being in that room and seeing someone coming down through the roof. And Jesus met this guy's greatest need. He looked at him and he said, rise up and walk, right? Not right away. What did he say? Your sins are forgiven you. He knew that this guy had a bigger need than just walking. He met his spiritual need. And if you follow the story, He did eventually heal the man because he wanted to prove to the Pharisees because how do you prove that you healed someone's sins? Kind of hard to prove. You can't can't see that. But Jesus had to prove to the Pharisees that he was who he said he would, so he healed healed the man, but he met his greatest need. And notice, in order to help people spiritually the way Christ did, you have to see them how they are. You have to care about how they are, and you have to do something about how they are. I think we could all use some intentionality when it comes to discipleship, when it comes to doing, opening our hands to meet the needs of people. I heard this phrase once, stuck with me. I think it might even be on the back wall in the foyer here. Save people. Need to serve this week. Who might? You need to serve this week. We looked at a lot of stats this morning about our town here in Sauk Center, Minnesota. Are there some needs here that we, either individually or as a church, could meet with the gospel of Christ? I I think so. Maybe it's because of divorce being an issue. Maybe we need to start a help for divorcees. Maybe because there's poverty in our town, we need to try to use that as a venue to bring people the gospel. Maybe because 52% of our community is single, we need to think about how we reach those people. Perhaps since there's such a large group of young people, young families, I think it was 40-some percent of families have kids under 18, maybe we need to target that as an opportunity. And you know, healthy. Growing churches 
will look like their community. Healthy churches always reflect the demographics of the community they live in because they're reaching those people. Do we have that? Is that part of our vision and goal at our church? Are we so stuck in the past not wanting to change that we, we just can't reach the community around us? Let me remind you that we're going to do this. We could look at a lot of Bible stories in the life of Christ. We need to not be afraid to deal with messy people. Sometimes it's going to get messy. And why should we be surprised at that? Especially when you have someone who lived a life of sin and then they come to Christ. They're going to have some baggage. We need to not be afraid to deal with people's baggage. That's one of the reasons that I do biblical counseling, that I'm working at certification in biblical counseling because I know that God's word has the answers to help us deal with our baggage. If you know someone like that, they're struggling with the baggage of their past, please send them to talk to me. The Bible has the answers. Don't be afraid of that. I like to think of the church as a city church. Yes, I know the church is for believers, and that's why when, when I preach, the majority of my content is geared towards believers. But Christ told his followers that they are a city set on a hill that cannot be hid. And so in one sense, our church here is for the city. Faith Baptist Church and Sauk Center is for our city. And for the cities around, we need to be reaching them with the hope of Jesus. This should take place in our church as well. Our mission of discipleship. Maybe for you, you can find a way to reach out to someone who's even sitting in here this week. Maybe God could use you to start a morning prayer group or lead a Bible study or invite someone for coffee, give someone hope when they're struggling. Would you be intentional in your efforts to step out of your comfort zone to step into the life of someone else. Discipleship requires intentionality. Let's be intentional about discipleship. Well, we open today by talking about manuals. I mentioned that if you have a manual and you don't use it, it's not really going to be much help to you. Christian life is the same way. We have the manual, God's guidebook, and even inside us we have the manual of the life of Christ. And here we have a passage this morning that we looked at, and we can see firsthand very simple, easy steps that we can take. Step out of our comfort zone and step into the life of someone else. 